Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back to another episode of Noble with Noble. This is episode 21. And uh, if you're liking the podcast, you know, give us a like, subscribe, five stars on Spotify, Apple Music, whatever. I usually forget, but I remember this time to put that on there. And today we have a uh, I know I always say that, that we have like a very special guest, but very special guest today. We got uh, Paige Megan. Paige is uh, the entertainment guy of Toronto. Self, not self-proclaimed. I proclaimed it, and I've got the honor to be beside the Minister of Defense, a man I've known <laughs> since he was a very young boy, and now is blossoming into something incredible. How are you, man? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm breathing. I'm yeah, alive. That's good. And, How are, uh, business is uh, business is good as as usual. Well, we got out of the woods. The pandemic was uh, pretty psycho. Uh, especially our industry, probably one of the uh, longest lasted uh, impacts plus uh, hardest hit. Um, and I'm I'm alive to tell, you know, a couple screws, couple scars and bruises, but we all we all made it through. So yeah, you know, that's good. Yeah, so I guess tell us a little bit about your business because, you know, I mean, some of the people who are watching know who the Megan boys are. Some people don't. So yeah, for sure. Well. Um, so I have a twin brother. There's two of us. We started a company, uh, basically out of high school or so. Uh, we were we were known as the Megan Boys, uh, and we started throwing parties. Uh, we started throwing events uh, for our you know our our friends and the people that knew us in you know grade 11, 12, 13. Um, and from that point, we kind of built a, a reputation to be the party guys in the city, uh, and. Um, while we were doing these all ages parties where on every Friday or Saturday night, we would have three, four, five, six hundred people show up. Uh, they were, you know, skewed to a little bit older than the bar mitzvah age, um, in which a parent, uh, a mother came up to me once at, at the mall and was like, Oh, I, I need, I need you guys. My, my older son goes to all your parties and I need you guys to DJ, uh, my, my daughter's bat mitzvah. We're like, bat mitzvah. What are you talking about? No chance. It's like, please, please. We're like, not not really for us. Three, four, five months later, um, we're, we walk into Kiva's and I see this lady again. And she's like, I need you to do this party. I've been looking for your number. I couldn't find it in the yellow pages. <laughs> the yellow <laughs> pages, way back. Yeah. Those like, don't, even, don't even exist like, anymore. We're dated here. Um, and she's like, um, well, I need you. I need you. I'm like, well, when's the event? And she's like, it's next year. We're like, next year? I'm like 18 years old. Next year? I don't know if I'm going to be alive next year. Like, what if, you know, people are now planning, you know, a year, two, th three years in advance for all their, you know, weddings and functions and so on. So we took her number, put it in our pocket. We're like, a few months later, like, I, it was in, like, my jacket. I look up. I'm like, remember that lady? Like, maybe we should give her a call, see what's going on. Because I guess you, you'd be getting paid for these events, too. Like, before the events you were hosting, were you charging people? or were Yeah. You... So we started throwing parties where we charge, like, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks cover. Uh, and my brother and I would be the DJs, but we really, really didn't even know what we were doing. We were like pressing play on a CD, pulling the CD out and pressing play again, like really just figuring it out on the fly, um, which I kind of uh, have no regrets about. I, I mean, because it was amazing how the, the audience wouldn't even know what good was or bad, because now you're seeing all these DJs in the world like with all on their social media and whatever and yeah. yeah back then it was just people just wanted to have a good time oh my god to good it, music it, I t back then when we were playing cds like you can jump on the on a dance floor and it would skip so we'd have to put like pillowcases underneath the machine oh, to make sure that the, yes it was like yeah. shock absorbed and stuff um anyway so we, we took this lady we, had, we found the lady's uh card we're like hey um do you remember us she's like oh of course i remember you guys i'm like have you made any decisions she's like oh i'm still waiting for you guys Set up a meeting, went to her house. My brother and I, you know, brought the equipment on our backs with speakers and all the things that they asked for. Uh, and we did that party. And from that one became two and two into three and four. And the story goes on where we um, built, a, built a business where we were providing joy for people. And so. you still are 20-something years later. Yeah. Which is insane. It's, it's been a pretty cool run. I... I find myself in situations all the time where someone was like, I met you in 2004, or you were my counselor in, in 2002, or, uh, and, and, you know, doing over 10,000 bar and bat mitzvahs uh, over the past, uh, I think more than that, actually. 
uh, over the past 20 years, way more than that, sorry, it's even a rough number, but uh, on, on a daily basis, like every day, not every other day, but every day, and multiple times a day sometimes, somebody who we did their bar mitzvah is now calling me for their wedding. Okay, I thought you were going to say their kids, Well, so, which is probably going to get there at well, the some data, point Well, the data on that, actually, now that that's, so now we're in year 23 or almost 24, uh, and so if a 13-year-old is... Um, 24, 37. So we're about, I'm predicting about 12 to 24 months away from doing someone's bar mitzvah where I did their parents' bar mitzvah. That's insane. That's it's crazy to think about. But so the crazy part for me is like, if someone, if the 20 year old version told me of me, told me at 40, I'm going to be doing this, this, that. I mean, I literally, like, I wouldn't believe that that would even be like, cool i mean i'm i've got like shade of gray like i've, <laughs> yes. I've, I've seen the, the light and it's funny it's crazy and proudly saying like we're cooler than ever better than ever and stronger and that personal connection uh is grown significantly with my kids and understanding that their age and their concerns and as well as the parents concerns as i'm a parent who just had a bar mitzvah myself um and so like my my EQ on it all has lifted us to a, a really special place. No, that's that's crazy. Like again, as a twenty year old, if you if someone came up to you and was like, you know, before this lady reached out and said, Hey, I want you to do this party, that, you know, your twenty year old self would say like or your your now self would say, Hey, you know, it's been twenty years, what what am I up to? Like, oh, you're doing the exact same thing, you're doing those parties, but now they're on a uh, an international scale also at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, crazy. You know, it, it's hard when you're 20 or, you know, in your 20s to see further than what's in front of you, you know. Uh, and it's really tough to also even get advice from people older than you. I remember people trying to say things to me. I'm like, yeah, whatever. What the hell you, do you know about me? You know nothing about me. It's like we're now I'm at a place where I, I understand how important it is to be listening to people and, and taking guidance not speaking as much, but being a bigger listener is where, you know, um, I learned that actually from pro, pro wrestling because uh, I would be with all these wrestler. I, I work with all these legends of wrestling. And every time I wanted to like get something in, I, I'd have them all say, you know, only because I care about you, they would say, there's like, just keep your mouth shut. Like be, a, have, be, have bigger ears than you have, than you do have a mouth so that you could, learn from those who came before you. Yeah, because starting a business at 20, most people don't know how to run a business, right? Sure. Like, obviously, you had your brother to help you out. But again, he's the same age. He's not someone who's had experience before. He's not someone who, you know, had this whole background on how you ran a business. And it kind of fell into your lap. You didn't have the plan to say, hey, you know, we're going to start this business. It was more of it came naturally. So when you started to get more money and and have all these like financial obligations. How did you navigate, I guess, distributing everything? Yeah, well, I mean, looking back with clarity, you know, I, I can't believe I was a boss at 20 or 22 or 24. Like, I mean, like managing, you know, 74 people on a weekend or 100 people and 27 events at 23 years old. Like, I, I mean, first of all, I think brain surgery was easier if, if I was to go into that field. <laughs> Probably. You know, um, and, and knowing how to treat people and knowing what mistakes you've made. Like, like you're not supposed to be good at anything unless you're, like, focusing on, like, high-achieving sports or something at 23 or 22. Like, you don't know how to do it, do business. You just ho hopefully have the right intent and you care about, you know, what you're trying to do. Um, but my, my advice to that next gen is, like, don't, don't even think about you don't need you don't need the money at 22 whether you're making 40,000 or 50,000 or 70,000 you don't even need that money you need to be learning what it costs and, and what it takes to be in that environment and handle it i always say if if someone called me to do the super bowl to produce the super bowl um what would you what would you do it for i go I would pay them 50k to be in that situation. Yeah, well, right? mo like even the the Super Bowl halftime performers, they don't get paid. No, no, they that, all that, that's a different do argument. It, do it for free, but you know, it's the same kind of idea. Like you're like, 
it's more of capitalizing on the opportunity yeah. than how much money you're going to make yeah. from the opportunity. So that, 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 that's the key is that, um, well, I do think that, you know, the talent should be paid for those things. Like it's more about the opportunity and what you do with that opportunity. Um, and every kind of moment, uh, equals the story. Right. Um, and so being put in those scenarios to, um, you know, find solutions or, or excel or to learn or even make mistakes all have a, have a significant value to me as part of the overall story of your life. So did your business grow from, like, did it grow naturally or were there things that you did for marketing and I guess like obviously there wasn't social media at the time, but ways to put yourself out there or was it more natural because you were hosting these events and doing a good, could you, there's a difference between, you know, you're DJing and you're behind the booth, so you can't really talk to people. It's more it's more so about the experience and and people listening and having a good time. Cause, you know, for your business, a lot of it is talking and meeting new people. And yeah. You know, I, I find that, you know, if you know you're working for yourself, you know, uh, you know, I look at that the, the gig the gig economy, right? You know, you do a good job, you'll get another good job. You know, like that little piece by piece mindset uh, was kind of where we were uh, taking it, not necessarily thinking about 10, 20, 30 years later or whatever it is. So we always treated that one gig, and I say this all the time, as if it was our Super Bowl, right? Um, and we always cared for that person. And, and, and I think our clients know that um, because I am emotionally connected to, to being a part of the most significant days of people's lives. Um, I mean, the speakers and the lights, I mean, they're all the same. I don't care who has one is better than the other. These are all functional chattels. But that secret sauce is kind of if giving a shit and caring deeply uh, and providing, you know, people with um, a service, I, th I think, I think allowed us to um, get the validation from the client uh, because every time we would do something, you would, they would say, last night was the greatest night of my life. Thank you so much for the greatest night of my life. I will never forget you for the rest of my life. Boom. Done. Keep doing it. And that that's similar to my business too, right? Like for finding people a house, that's the most important thing, right? It's such a big asset in their life and to go out there and help them find their dream home. How many shots like, you got? How many you shots know? you got at that? Like, you know. Exactly. And, and even if, let's say, for example, it's their first place, which obviously wouldn't be their dream home. It could be, but most times it's not. Mm -hmm. Getting that second house or like that third house and like helping people out and, and having them remember you is, is huge. Well, so, so how, you, you, how you do that and how you treat people, how you make them feel, I think those are all very significant points. And for you, as you're a 26-year-old, you know, 27-year-old, uh, you know, I look at these opportunities as a – and again, I only started thinking in this way. And I don't think about it as in I need to redeem or profit on it. I just, I'm finding myself in this situation where you want to have enough of those things where all of a sudden there's like a conveyor belt, right? And then eventually that the first one in 10 years from now is going to be your 53rd one. Come, and, yeah, and then it's going to come around. back. And so that conveyor belt to me of having things working for you, it's, especially with today's like, young you know person that's got side hustle and got like all these extra arms i always say like you know you, you got to be you got to be an octopus with all these tentacles right so that you could um really facilitate more than one thing S same as you know social media snapchat tiktok instagram face where are you so well, do you, do you, you, you gotta got you gotta have arms here so do you think it's more important to focus on a couple of things at once or this is all one thing that you're that you're focusing on but using these branches as ways to bring it all back to yeah. the same. Yeah. Off the bat, I'd say go all in on one thing. You know, people always say, well, you can only dance at one bar mitzvah or you can only be good at one thing. I I think the story for that hasn't been finished. Uh, yes, if you are a plumber, you should be a plumber. Uh, but learning about other things that are within that sector or industry to help you um, have a wider lens, I think is super important. Um, and I think it's really tough today to even survive on one job, like, you know, for certain people. So, um, you know, I think that the story about having 
multiple opportunities and multiple kind of tentacles, uh, I think this generation uh, is comfortable with their brain being compartmentalized into different silos because of, again, Snapchat, TikTok, this, this, like, where are you? There's 11 of you. Yeah. How, how do you want them to think about you? What do you want from them? What do you need to do with them? And I guess how, yeah, like how, how they find you because w when you started, you didn't have social media, right? So what, what did you do? Yeah, so it's funny. So the biggest thing that I ever did as an entrepreneur, which was my biggest uh, fail, there's this beautiful story, if you don't mind me sharing with you. No, but please. So right when we first started, we were like doing whatever we could, whatever we thought we could do to uh, get awareness. Um, ultimately, it came down to being good, doing the gigs, getting really, you know, in front of your audience. And so we never, so we were like dabbling with like putting an ad in a paper or doing this thing or that thing. Um, well, ironically, we, we were very hungry and thirsty just to succeed. Uh, we're on 18 years old, I believe, uh, 19 years old. And um, the Raptors, uh, do you remember when, like, in 2001, like, Vince Carter, like, Purple Fever? Yeah. Do you remember, like, yeah. it was all, like, the headbands? So the real funny story about that was that my brother and I were, were trying to be entrepreneurs at the same time and trying to overextend ourselves and take shots. Uh, and um, we bought 10,000 purple headbands. Okay. okay. Uh, you know where this is going or no? No. Okay, no. good, good. So 10,000 purple headbands. And we were like, you know what? Let's get all of our friends and we're going to sell them outside of the ACC, the Scotiabank Arena, uh, because it was purple fever for the Raptors playoffs. They were playing Philly with uh, Allen Iverson and all that. Yeah. And we were so hyped about it. We're like, let's do this. Let's do this. And then we kind of got, we bought it. We made a $20,000 investment. We had did not have this money. We had to borrow it with a friend. Like it was like a big deal 20 grand 18 19 years old taking a shot these were no like no brand they were just just purple, purple. okay just straight and, and purple. good luck finding purple headbands by the way okay like trust well, me yeah. i'm like, sure you also no, bought all, all the had, ones we stuff. bought white ones and they had to dye them overnight and it was a full really? shit show crazy anyway so had about 20 of our friends and then we were like you know what maybe we can actually call like what if we call uh acc it's Scotia Bank Arena, but like, why don't we call the ACC and maybe we can like sell them to them and they can use them because now we have these purple headmen versus trying to sell them one by one. It's like, well, we'll probably have to sell them for less. And we were just navigating this. Anyways, we called the ACC and we're like, hey, um, do you guys need purple headbands? We're like, well, what do you need? What do you mean purple headbands? Like, yes, we have a supply of 10,000. We're a company that has these purple headbands and with purple fever, we think it's a great idea to have these for your fans and this and that. And so the story kind of shifted where they said, no, no, thank you. So we're like, all right, let's just go back to our street team idea, all of our friends and so on. So that morning we were getting all of our friends ready and so on to go to the, to the, uh, to the arena outside of it to sell uh, all the swag. Uh, and we opened the paper up and it says uh, Purple Fever. Raptors can't wait for their game three of the playoffs the first 10,000 fans get a free purple headband. Oh, okay. That's brutal. <laughs> Fucking like, they like basically like, I, I don't know. Maybe they had that plan or they just, I, I, I'd use a video, uh, video store, jumbo video reference, but I'll just use it as, as if like a silver city one. That's like going to Yorkdale and trying to sell popcorn outside of the movie theater when the popcorn's free inside. Yeah. Like, the idea of this was so next level brain hemorrhaging for us that it's like insane. So, but I'm like, guys, we got to go. All of our friends were fucking dying of laughter. Well, of course. Because we're like purple headbands, purple headbands. And people are like, they're free inside, idiot. Like, they're like, whatever. Like, people were constantly being like, why do I need purple headbands? I, what, didn't you read the paper today? And so what was the learn from that, from that part of the story? And there's a better part of it, but it was like, you know, you gotta, sometimes you got to keep your cards closed. Like, you know, you try to be ambitious and stuff and, you know, maybe take the shot, but also like be aware that what that shot's worth, what that value is and how do you kind of come out of it alive? Anyways, we probably sold like 300 of the 10,000. Okay. We're sitting on mountains <laughs> of, of purple headbands. Yeah. No, like this, our garage, like you could swim Okay, 
in a sea of purple headbands. Okay. Um, anyway, so that summer, um, my brother ends up going to Camp Walden as a counselor. And he was packing his bags and he had all these little gimmicks with them and this and that. Anyways, he brings like a thousand of these purple headbands to camp. And not knowing what he's going to do with them, but it was just like, it didn't, like at this point, he just had them. Anyways, he, he built this club called the Purple Headband Club. At, for, for, I guess, for all the campers. For all the kids and whoever wanted to join it. And then all of a sudden, the kids were on, on, in, on inner camp. They're like, oh, I want a purple headband. Oh, that's the kid. That's the guy with the purple headband guy. This and that. Okay. So we're like, okay, whatever. Like, she was like, yeah, I built this thing. Like, we still have like 9,600 of these left <laughs> yeah, to go. Just, what are we going to do? Yeah. Anyways, one week after uh, the, su the summer ended, our phone blows up. Okay. Literally hundreds, hundreds of clients calling us saying, um, hi, I'm looking for a guy who's got the Purple Headband Club. Uh, my son is talking about you and needs you at his bar mitzvah for three years from now, two years from now. We literally got like 350 parties from this Purple Headband Club. That's crazy. So it, it came full circle, right? You you failed and you had this whole opportunity that you know shot down, but... You kept going and you found like other alternatives Monster. just to use it and, it and it paid off like crazy. So, you know, you, you, the story is still needs to be told, right? Like it's like this fail where you think it's a massive psycho epic fail happened to be the catalyst about how, what did you do? Do you advertise this and that? Well, we just kept being us. Um, and these, the, I've been in many situations where the bad thing that happened was mo maybe the most beautiful thing I've ever done happened to me because of how we persevered and how we got through the the moments. No, it's it's a really good story and like a, a good lesson again for people who you know are starting a business or like yeah. have ideas and or have failed and don't know what to do after they've failed because sometimes it it kills you. You go out, you do something, you try, you fail and it Again, it, it kills you. Like people don't know what to do after that, but it's about managing what you have and how you can capitalize on it. And again, you didn't even think that this thing was gonna blow up, but utilizing the the tools that you had with giving out these headbands, even if the first thousand were, were free to these I little still kids. Have some somewhere. I'm sure you still have some, right? And did, did you give them out at the at the parties? Yeah, so then we started selling yeah. prizes. We're like, oh, you gotta have a fifty Purple, so we started slicing them off and re, re skinning them. It's like you know, and repurposing. Um, but the, the you know the trigger to me was like with what what you just said was like, you know, grind now. You know, figure grind. It's not about the money per se, but about being put in situations where you can pound and just be immersed with opportunities and figuring them out. And I mean now with like internet and stuff like. You know, you can have a, you can get information about things to smarten yourself up. Um, but also you got to go with your instinct too. Like all the time I'll do things where someone's like, I'm doing my research on this, this, that. And I'll be like, I'm not doing anything other than going with my gut. And that's equal, that's equal. Like, so, but my gut is 20 plus years of business opportunities that have allowed me to have a gut. Yeah. So qualifying the scenario is important. Right. So after these, I guess you you did this for X amount of time, but once COVID started, yep. everything kind of shifted, right? Like now I guess you're going through your gut because you know what you've done the past 20 years, but what's changed since COVID? Because like you said, you're, you're in the party industry. You were the first ones to go yeah. and the last ones to come back because yeah. no one wanted to, to be in a room with more than, you know, three people. Yeah. And coming back again some people still aren't even comfortable going to these places a without a mask and b at all sometimes because they're you know i guess they're they're afraid of it cautious, which yeah totally fine being cautious but how did your business shift well okay so so let's the covid story with our 20th year in business like official 20th year we were doing parties for longer than that but 20th year in business we were planning on having a massive party like the Page and Gion's like bar mitzvah celebration style where we were going to have literally um, this like thousand dollar a ticket fundraiser to raise money for like kids 
that didn't have our mitzvahs or for underserved communities and all this give back was very, it still is extremely important to us. Um, and we were planning on doing this and we, we, our whole model was like anyone that was our client, they'd probably want to support this because they know how valuable the experience of, you know, creating, you know, a, a celebration yeah, were. Yeah, their own party and then now so, yeah, giving back. So it was logical for us. And we had this idea. We're bringing Cool in the Gang and like Lionel Richie and like a massive million dollar idea to raise money for for cause. Um, and then COVID, you know, we had a thousand events on the books going into 2020. Um, and COVID, you know, shut it down. And, and I mean, what was interesting about it was, you know, I had... A thousand clients at you know two thousand dollars deposit each. That's like two million bucks, in which we have an operating line of like you know three hundred thousand dollars. Like it's not like we're just working off of that because you've got cash flow and deposits and payments for staff and insurance and things. So, like if the average person was was to tell me, you know, five years ago that this was going to happen to me, I I want to walk into oncoming traffic like. We couldn't even bear the idea of of losing our whole existence, our whole identity, for like two years at least. Well, well, but this is happening like in real time, yeah. right? This is like March, um, but a few weeks into COVID, like, you know, I'm I'm literally at home. We ended up creating like this like fake movie theater from our kids where they have to get the tickets, and we instead of we'd make popcorn, we'd have all these activities, and I was watching. We we're watching. Coming to America. Okay. Great movie. Great movie. The first, there was a second one, too. Of I don't course. think I watched a second one, but I watched, like, obviously I've seen the first no. one. No. So this is so we're watching with our kids, and my brother calls me and goes, hey, do you remember we were supposed to do that massive gala tonight? Like, this massive gala was on the books for a year. We do it every year. And I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't even realize it was supposed to be tonight. It was we what we paid attention to. It was the first time. In our lives, that we had a consecutive three Saturday nights off in a row in twenty five years. Like, first of all, that's a lot. And your body, your body, like, actually is used to it. And I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I didn't even think about that. And I, I'm like, well, I'm watching Coming to America with my kids. And and at that point, I'm like, you could have put me in the penthouse suite at the Four Seasons in Hawaii. With my family, or I, I was equally as satisfied as smelling their farts and eating Doritos, watching this movie. And what what happened to us was, we didn't even know the exhaustion and the tunnel vision that we had about our business because we lived every inch of it. You're every so week. used to it. Every Seven time. days a week, dude. Yeah. Every Saturday, Sunday night, wake up, go to bed at two in the morning. Come back Monday, bam, boom, boom. And so, like, just that alone and the fact that we could survive in that environment was was very significant to us. Um, but but I, I, what started happening was people were starting to do, like, Zoom events and Zoom bar mitzvahs. And, and actually, Instagram was a place where people were doing, like, these lives. Like Yeah, where, I think I did a few. I was... Uh... DJing a little bit and yeah, I'd, I'd go and, and just a way to share, yeah. There and and like on Twitch, where it was Twitch you know, like could, crazy, TikTok was crazy, yes. Yeah. So, so I started doing this thing where I'd be like, Hey, it's live with Paige Megan, and I'd have friends come on and I'd be like, Oh my god, how's your family? How's this? How's that? And I started getting people watching it, and then all of a sudden, a caterer was like, Hey man, like, do you mind uh giving my food a, a shout out? We're doing home deliveries. We're, I'll, I'll give you some free food. So within a day, like within a week of me doing this, my fridge was full. My fridge was full. Then a whiskey guy messaged me. I thought, I'm like, holy shit, like I'm actually feeling just as satisfied, satisfied yeah. doing this. So I started getting like celebrities and I got this guy and that wrestler and this person that had this cause. And every night I started doing it. Well, People started thinking that I was a, a an expert at filming. <laughs> an influencer? Yeah. Well, they thought yeah. I was an expert at filming and streaming when all I was doing was pressing the live button. Um, reputation, right? They, they associated me with knowing 
that I would do good work. Uh, and because of it, I actually was awarded the rights to the filming, streaming, and on-site execution of all of um, Benjamin's funerals from the funeral home. Okay. So the Megan boys went from weddings and bar mitzvahs to funerals, to funerals within the that's same... A, that's a crazy... The same like, pivot. The, the pivot. Yeah. The pivot. Crazy jump. And And so within seconds, as I was speaking to a client... Or understanding what their needs were, I I quickly emotionally connected with, well, candle number twelve at that bar mitzvah, or when the wedding when the groom's walking down the aisle, or a funeral. I mean, they're actually all significant, and they were very full moments, um, and so we became comfortable in that stressful environment, which I don't think the average person would have been. But because of the the difficulty of the event space about always being on, always trying to be different, always trying to reinvent yourself, always trying to uh, create something special, um, COVID allowed us to feel calm in yeah. where or where that where that chaos some people just can't handle. Um, and so through that, we started doing all these virtual events, and so I actually was started hosting these. At like bar mitzvahs on Zoom and these corporate events on Zoom and I couldn't believe it. But me personally, I got the same dopamine, same gratification, same level of, of fulfillment on my Zoom, doing something, even if I was wearing my underwear from the waist down, but like you, all you saw was this. Yeah. I got the same gratification doing that as I, as me on stage fist pumping for six hours. Same. I was like, oh my God, how, how am I in this? You yeah, know? because, you know, again, it's such a hard time in people's lives when they're having a funeral, but also such a happy moment uh, for, I guess, the bar and bat mitzvahs. And, you know, in both situations, you're celebrating somebody. And I know it's in a different way, but it's, it's I guess, like refreshing to know that, you know, you can make light of such an unfortunate situation in yeah, some people's I, lives. I wouldn't say make light. I'd say more find purpose and meaning for for the scenario and caring for it. You know, uh, that make light was more for the the ver my live stuff, not for the funerals. But the idea of us being so um, integ integral was comfortable for us. Uh, and fairly quickly, we said, you know, obviously our business is smashed murdered like killed um but we we immersed ourselves and and we are so grateful that we have the ability to to persevere yeah because it, again yeah it's 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 interesting having those different shifts like are you still doing those yeah virtual okay yeah there's a hybrid i think there's a hybrid i think people yeah. are still itching for going back to an in-person experience and they're feeling that they need that and they want that. And I, I've seen, I think we've seen a good um, inbound of that, obviously post COVID. Uh, I think it's kind of softening up a little bit because it's been too much. Uh, and I think it's going to, I mean, I don't think it's going to go back to zero. I don't think it's going to go back to, to where it was a year ago. Um, but I think that whatever it is, it needs to be done right. And so, I think quality over quantity is, is a thing. Absolutely. It, it always has been. Yeah. I think. So, yeah, I guess uh, shifting gears a little bit from that, uh, I guess both both things that you're doing, it's it's like, um, you know, not like investing, but you have two different business or it's it's the same business, but you have multiple businesses that you're sort of managing and, and doing that. And I know that you've done some investments for other companies. Yeah. Um, what's it like? sort of branching out between going and working on your own business and investing in other people's businesses and opportunities? Um, well, first of all, I have, I have a twin brother, which I'm really lucky for. So, um, you know, but he's operating the business day to day while I'm uh, working on biz dev for uh, more than a handful of, of companies. Um, but they're all things that I'm interested in. And they're all authentic to kind of who I am, meaning like, you know, I always say like, would I ever call 
Ryan Noble out of nowhere, been like, Ryan, long time. I've got this uh, diamond mining company in Ghana. I want you to install, uh, invest your life away. You're like, yo, didn't you do my bar mitzvah 20 years ago? Like, yeah. Cut. You know, but authentic stuff that I like and I need to, I'm very interested in, in tech and uh, real estate and content and media and, you know, just things that I, I just, that I like, but I'm now building kind of a book of, of clients that have me on retainer where I'm kind of doing some biz dev for people and, um, the key for me is that, you know, if I don't know about this thing, well, fortunately my, my Rolodex, I could find you the world expert of that thing or a thought leader of that thing, which allows me to validate what, what do I know about digital banks? Nothing, but I know the number four guy at Scotia or RBC who I did his family functions or I did this versus that. And I have the ability to um, leverage my, my network, which uh, was the one thing I never paid attention to in co because we were so busy just working on the events that we didn't realize we built, you know, 20 plus 25 years of meaningful connections. The amount of people that you know is crazy. But like you said, there's a difference between knowing people and having that meaningful connection, yeah, right. Like I like we spoke about this off camera before, but you know, you did my bar mitzvah, and that was whatever 14, 15 years ago. And you know, I gave you a call the other day, and it was as if like we've been real. friends our entire life. We are, and I was you know thirteen years old at the time. But you know, you having that connection with like my family and the friends and all of that, it's it's so nice to see because you know, it, it's like that for a lot of businesses, but for yours, the connection is so much. Like it's so special, yeah. You because, know, like you said, you know the, the whole thing with with having someone's prime mitzvah. It's like that's a pivotal moment in in their moment, lives. You said it right. The moment in time. Where were you when? Who were you when? Who was I when? You know, and it's one of those you know wedding bar mitzvah. Like these are significant kind of milestones, and um, you know that's real for us. Like, and I'm fortunate to care like that. You know, it's like people are like you know you know I always say like you know. There's some people that are like in my industry that are like, you know, like Krusty the Clown, like backstage or smoking butts with a wife beater on and they're not them in, you know, to the client, they're someone else. And I think, you know, again, everyone has to be their own way of doing stuff, but we live in the space of creating those meaningful connections and meaningful experiences and meaningful moments. Um, and so I, is that my secret sauce? I don't know, but, but, but I could tell you that 20 years later, being able to remember every person and understand everything and seeing the growth of the people, who you were at 13, who you are at 27, well, you've gone exponential from who you were at 13 to 27. Well, now you're in, from 27 to 40, something's going to happen to you, right? And it's likely going to be that you're successful because you're starting here with the intent of doing things to be successful. So if you stick around long enough, in any venture you do, I believe the good will come as long as you're good through that whole journey. And so I'm here for it. I'm here to live and embody that and help next gens speak to 65-year-olds, speak to six-year-olds, learn about where people's heads are at at all time. Yeah, I and I was going to say we're, we're almost at the end. And I was going to leave you with one question, which was, you know, what is it that you would give like what not advice but what's the most important thing for someone who's starting in their 20s to grow their business but i feel like you kind of answered it unless you have another answer you know simple just, first of all be nice to people like really it sounds so dumb but I, I it's just be a good person your reputation is everything i, I have a quick story for you if you don't mind Tell uh, it. i was at united bakers once and i was walking by and I see a, a mother with her mother, so a booby and her mother and the daughter and the granddaughter. And then we're talking to them, schmoozing, this and that. And then all of a sudden, as I'm walking by, a grandmother and another mother walk by. I say, hey, Paige, how's it going? I'm like, oh, you were great at that party. It was so nice to see you. Great. They walk by. I, I go back to, I, I turn back around to speak to the people that I was originally speaking to. And the grandmother goes, what was that daughter's name? I'm like, it was so-and-so. She's like, and that was the mother, 
I'm like, yeah. She's like, what was her name? She's like, I'm like, so-and-so. She's like, oh, my God. This is an 85-year-old. She goes, oh, my God. That girl was such a slut in high school. <laughs> <laughs> that many years. 70 years later, it still stuck. Was a mind blow because about how you make people feel what you do to them at any point in your journey will be held on to and so you can't be perfect but that solved all of my thoughts and being a good person and having a clean reputation of doing meaningful things is the biggest currency you've got and then on the other side of things about taking chances and stuff you know i always say in order to taste sweet, you got to taste sour. How do you know what good is if you haven't experienced bad? And so that's where my my heart is and that's where, where my, my brain kind of drives me through and gets me through days of difficulty versus days that are easy. Um, and I'm all about just be, being a part of the next thing. And I love it and I'm grateful for, you know, just uh, having the ability to be in business and provide. Yeah, and I'm listen, you, you've done an incredible job doing that, and hopefully the next 20, 40, 60 years, and, you know, maybe you're, uh, maybe Preston will uh, take on the legacy in, uh, in the future, but... Uh, Preston, you hear that? You know, <laughs> if, he's, if he's listening, I think, uh, you know, th the way, again, like you said, the way that you treat people and just being nice to them, I think is, is so important. Yeah, so. and I'm excited to see you grow. You're putting this intent out, man, like... It's everything. Don't worry about the one home run. You're you're in the conveyor belt. You're at the beginning of the conveyor belt. And once it starts turning, I I I would love to go back on this conversation in three years, five years, ten years, and see where the hell you're well, at. We can have you back on the podcast Let's in three or five years and uh, see where how far we've come. Maybe we'll do uh, like so hologram so. versions of us. Yeah, it does. Let's uh, hey, listen. Who who knows how it's going to be in in a couple years, but. Anyway, Paige, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, you, I'm for so coming proud of you. on. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, where can people find you or your company yeah. online? Uh, business people, you know, hit me on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Works. Um, connect. Um, Instagram, my personal and my just my business stuff. And just know that, like, I'm, uh, I'm always happy to have a conversation with someone if they're looking to create opportunities, whether it was just as a helping hand or – as someone that looks is looking to participate in in providing value. Okay. That's great. Well, yeah, we're we're going to link it down uh in the description by whatever, but uh Boom. Again. Yeah, th thanks you for coming on and uh we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for having me.